I'm in a little square, hi. We were just a large group of nerds that traveled as a pack. Our guest is Rob Malga, who founded Slashdot.org. Now, a lot of you may not remember Slashdot.org, but it was a pioneering news aggregator site with really interesting moderation tools and moderation systems. And Slashdot, and with Rob at the helm, struggled with so many of the issues that we're still struggling with today. So I invited Rob to come on and talk to us about what he learned and the story of how he evolved Slashdot's tools to try and keep up with this arms race of people that uh, want to have their voices heard on the web in all different kinds of ways. So like the web itself, Slashdot was highly influential and it was ever evolving. And it was a mix of moderation with algorithm. And that mix is really hard to get right. So today you're gonna find out what a true OG of online communities has to say about what's going on today, where we've come from and where we're possibly heading. So join me in welcoming Rob Malda. For those who don't know you, give us a whirlwind tour of how you first got started in tech mm -hmm. and in editing and the, the pivot points, the experiences that led you to founding and running Slashdot. Uh, I was an 80s nerd. Uh, my father would bring home uh, a computer from work. In this era, it would be an XT. Uh, and I would be, he was bringing it home to do work and I would then use it to play video games or to code. Uh, by mm, sixth, seventh grade, I was writing my own video games. By seventh, eighth grade, I had a modem uh, and was dialing into local BBSs. And my, most of the people that I was dealing with on the BBSs or that I related to actually ended up being kids in the same middle school as me. Uh, and then by the time we got through high school, we all went to college together. Uh, and we were just a large group of nerds that traveled as a pack, uh, working, we, we kind of all worked in some of the same places. We, we had related jobs all in the tech industry. Uh, we were all very early Linux adopters, uh, sci-fi nerds, uh, and circa 1997, uh, we were all working as uh, web engineers in various capacities uh, and doing hobby projects and stuff and also school projects. And Slashdot very much grew out of just my personal projects at the time. Uh, I was interested in tech news and sci-fi and video games and building web platforms. And I built Slashdot over the course of the following year or so. Uh, and it went from zero to hundreds of thousands of users and basically took over my life for the better part of a decade. Early on, when it wasn't hundreds of thousands of users, when it was your first hundred to thousand, what mm -hmm. was the culture like? The culture was very much just people I hung out with in chat rooms. Uh, it was, uh, I was I was very active in a number of mailing lists. Uh, they were Linux technical mailing lists, uh, uh, some graphic designer types who were working on improving the look and feel of the Linux operating system uh, for casual users. Uh, a lot of sysadmin types. Our discussions, unsurprisingly, were like that. Uh, we, In terms of demographics, uh, we were very much the demographics of the early 90s internet. Uh, that is to say it looked a lot like me. Uh, white middle-class kids uh, who grew up in an environment where they had access to PCs and modems uh, in the 80s, which, as you are probably aware, uh, was not commonplace. Uh, so... Uh, the people who were on the internet in the mid 90s were very much the people who had been using computers in the mid 80s. And so our discussions looked like what you would imagine those discussions to look like. There, the conflicts and such that grew up over time, uh, I mean, that grew up around sort of this core group of people who were just chit chatting and having a good time uh, and talking about their technology and their gadgets and their video games and such. And then over time, uh, as uh, you are well aware, uh, any any audience uh, that gathers uh, uh, has a, a risk associated with it of being a viable target for uh, bad behavior. Uh, and as our audience grew, uh, so then did our bad behavior. Of course, our bad behavior always existed because we were also a bunch of jerks, uh, but uh, we were lovable jerks. Uh, and by the time uh, you know, we had grown to, you know, let's say 50 or 100,000 users. 
there were then enough people around uh, to make being annoying uh, and interfering with the population uh, a regular part of the problem. As Slashdot grew, the culture changed and you became a target because it was more popular and visible and because you attracted people outside of the core group and because human beings change as their communities scale. So as it was getting big and that culture was changing, you started to develop moderation tools to manage these developments. How? Did, what first motivated you to create those moderation tools and moderation systems? How did they evolve? What happened? What worked really well? What like blew up in your face? Well, okay. The first thing is that uh, for the first nearly year of Slashdot, there was no user accounts. Uh, nobody logged in for anything. If I posted a comment, if anybody posted a comment, they just wrote whatever they name, whatever name they wanted into the name field. There was no perpetual identity. That was the level of trust and friendship that existed uh, in 1997 for the first 10, 20,000 users. Over the course of uh, the first year or so, people started doing more malicious things, uh, not the least of which would be posting a comment and then signing at Commander Taco saying stuff like, you know, the site's policies are changing or something, you know, taking, uh, making bold proclamations with my name on it. Uh, they, there was malicious stuff too, people impersonating each other. But I mean, in general, it was it was mostly pretty lighthearted. But it got to a point where I basically had to do something about it because people would post stuff on the site, uh, you know, making their pro proclamations about what the site was going to be doing next week. And then I would get hate mail telling me, like, how dare you do this thing? Like, I, don't even, I didn't want that thing. I didn't write that thing. So I, I added user accounts uh, in 98, uh, at which point, uh, I unintentionally bifurcated the audience uh, into two separate segments, one who was willing to log in and the other who didn't care. Uh, and while th the general population was the same, certain behavior traits became more prominent in one group versus the other. Uh, we certainly saw good comments from anonymous users, but by and large, the more malicious uh, stuff tended to come from anonymous users. Um, maybe... Uh, Around the same time, I mean, I, I, I built the user account system because I knew I needed to have some tools because the, the abuses were beginning to be a thing. And the I started building sort of the first round of tools. The first round of tools was very closed. Me and my buddies, the guys that I knew in middle school and high school mostly, uh, would just uh, you know, troll through the site looking for, uh, looking for abusive behavior and we would moderate it down or get it out of the system using whatever tools we had at the time. And then that became not scalable. Uh, you know, once once we got to a point where there were thousands of comments a day instead of hundreds, that was not the sort of thing that five people could just do. Uh, so we get we went through a series of iterations uh, where we basically granted more power to more people and and widened the circle with each pass, uh, starting with a hundred or so people that we had never met uh, but had good behavior on the site, uh, which basically taught us that one percent of people are assholes. Uh, and they will abuse power if granted to them, uh, which very much informed the system as it evolved. Uh, we also learned that uh, most people get bored real quick. Uh, if you give somebody a lot of power in a community system like this, they tend to use it a whole bunch and then get bored uh, and then go on with their way. Uh, and that informed the sort of the second or third generations of the system where we really started looking at the users that were participating on the platform and then allocating moderator access to them for limited windows based on their historical contributions. Uh, if you're a jerk, you don't get to play anymore. And if uh, you're a kind uh, contributing member of the forum, uh, then you get to moderate. Uh, and that works reasonably well. Uh, we then built a sort of another ring of tools around that uh, uh, what I refer to is the meta moderation system. Uh, the moderation system watched the comments, and the meta moderation system was the mo was watching the moderators. That was a system whereby anybody could theoretically participate. You just visit a web page, and you would basically get, be given a selection of moderations done by your peers uh, from the previous you know X days, and you would then decide if they were fair or unfair. Uh, so if you were a moderator, you would decide if a comment was insightful or flame bait. And then a week later, another user, actually seven or eight or nine users, would then vote to decide if your moderation was fair or not. Uh, and if you continue to be fair, then you continue to be given turns. And if you are unfair, then you are weeded out and goodbye, thanks for playing. Uh, go read some other horrible website.
that's the whirlwind introduction of it. That represents maybe three or four years of development uh, as we scale from a thousand to a million. When you say that 1% of your users are assholes and you give them power and you find out they're assholes, I wanted to dig into that a little. What happened? Did you look at well-behaved users algorithmically, give them power and a small percent of them were assholes? Well, yeah, uh, and that that sort of th there, there's a bunch of like ge generic long tail rules that sort of all float into the same bucket, right? Like 99% of people never participate in any forum whatsoever. 99% of anything, any user generated content is crap. Uh, so you end up with 0.1% of you uh, of users creating everything of value uh, in most communities. Uh, but a similar ratio seems to hold true uh, for behavior, uh, for, for negative behaviors. Uh, you know, I don't know what, 10% of people think they can contribute, but most of them are wrong. Uh, and some of them realize that, yeah, they can contribute there, but they would be more fun to contribute in a negative way. And some people are contributing in a negative way uh, from a legitimate place of dissent. Uh, and that's kind of the challenge, right, is to identify the difference between uh, legitimate dissenting opinion and uh, bad actors attempting to manipulate the system. Uh, a really simple problem uh, that you would see all the time, which was one that our moderation system never really dealt with particularly well, uh, was the notion of uh, uh, a moderator going on a reign of terror. Uh, we, I, I, the, the system was designed around these constraints to, to give you limited power, uh, but it was possible for a user to engage in bad practices, but in a really subtle way that you context that, that regular users might not contextually be aware of. You could post nine comments in a day and say, Linux is cool, Linux is cool, Linux is cool, Linux is cool, get mo get moderated up a bunch of times, right? Because you're saying Linux is cool. And that's a that's a group think sort of thing. You're speaking to the conventional conventional wisdom of the population. And then you can get out there and let loose with something horrible. Uh, and then the sum of the activity done to your account, uh, the moderations done to you, you know, Linux is good, Linux is good, Linux is good, you get a bunch of upvotes. And then the horrible thing that you say, you get some downvotes, and then the system has to try to figure out the difference between the two. Well, to a regular human being, it's actually not that big of a deal, right? You look at the list, you say, well, you got 20 moderations, eight, uh, you know, 10 of them were good, 10 of them were bad. Like you can, you can look at that and you can sort of see logically what's happening but you have access to a lot of information that uh, regular users don't have. Regular users usually see a single comment uh, in the context of a of one thread. They might not realize that that one malicious user could actually be 10 user accounts, could be five user accounts and five anonymous user accounts. That user could be coming through Tor uh, and so therefore completely anonymous. Uh, and they, you might not know that their previous nine comments were very group thinky uh, warm, touchy, feely, and then number ten was intentionally designed uh, to be malicious. So what I sort of learned, the internal tracking for this was was we called it karma, uh, and uh, we we unintentionally created a whole series of uh, bad behaviors around the notion of we called it karma whoring. Uh, you'd whore for karma by posting positive things, and then you would spend effectively a currency that you had earned within the context of this system uh, by being a dick. Uh, to uh, to your peers, uh, and they, things like that went on throughout the th throughout you know for a good seven eight years. That was a huge part of what we did on a day to day basis was just finding whatever the new behavior was, and then figuring out the test and the way to remove it from the population for the future. And you know these are not solved problems today. No, no. So, did anything to what we were doing, they all started over and just made the same mistakes again. Yeah, it's well, it's hard. You know, there's a lot of emergent properties in complex systems that are hard to um, hard to know what's going to happen. But the karma horn thing is really interesting because I would say you were in some sense a pioneer of gamification oh, yeah. because you were, um, you know, one of the things that I think we've all learned, all of us who grew up on the web and participate in this, is that if you show people a number that'll go up or you show them some sort of leaderboard with or you know rank orderings uh, along some metric they will try and game it yeah that's one of the lessons that i try to give people at every opportunity the original database record for that particular attribute the karma attribute was uh, was called like some mod total 
uh, something innocuous like that. And it was a private integer that I never put publicly on the user interface. Uh, at some point, uh, I put it on the user interface uh, just because it was fun and it was, and it was an interesting number, but I didn't really think through the consequences of that. Uh, and what happened almost immediately is it turned into a video game. And we actually ended up, um, uh, we saw accounts show up on eBay that had scores in the hundreds. Uh, people would like try to sell their accounts. Uh, now, the one guy that put his account on eBay, uh, the last one, uh, he had like a karma of like 300 or 400 or something, which was ludicrously high for the system at the time. And uh, I ended up uh, writing a script that randomly changed his karma. Uh, <clears throat> but it always got smaller and uh, it approached zero. So he had zero comma the, the moment his eBay auction ended. Uh, so I, I had my fair share of fun messing with the people that were trying to mess with my system. But I changed the, val the name of that integer to karma. I made it public. And that probably wasn't the best decision because I basically spent the next couple of years having to walk that back because once you give a user a number, you can't take it away from them. Uh, I had to abstract it somewhat uh, and also cap it. At some point we put the number, like first we capped it at 50 uh, because the intent behind that particular value was simply for me to distinguish a uh, long time contributing user from newbie from clear obvious jerk. Uh, it was not intended as, it was not designed as a scoring system. It was designed just to let me sort you into these three buckets. Uh, and that proved uh, no longer to serve that purpose once uh, once karma became a currency and a, and a scoring mechanism, a measuring contest, if you will. Uh, we eventually uh, capped it at 50, and then eventually I even further abstracted it and changed it to using uh, uh, labels like, you know, good and bad and neutral and, and that sort of thing. And the actual numbers under the hood then were, were ultimately made invisible to regular uh, mortal users because I needed that information uh, to be useful. Uh, and when I incentivized people and, and unintentionally incentivized them uh, in a way that you just watch as Twitter and Facebook and every platform that comes along goes through the exact same thing. It's like, well, I'll give them a score and watch that score go up and watch people be jerks as they try to game their scores. Like, no, you don't. It's not hard. You just don't do that. You just do these other three things instead. You have to abstract it through just enough. And people never do that. That's, that's, a, that's not a 1.0 feature uh, for, for developers. Well said. Well said. It's so true. You know, you're... You're either a positive contributor or you're not. And whether you have 207 or 202 uh, in some table, it doesn't really matter. It's not your attack power in a role-playing game. It doesn't make you better. The goal here is to facilitate a conversation. Uh, the goal here is not uh, to defeat the biggest monster in the game uh, and to do so faster than the person uh, who's on the other end of the internet and competing with you in some sort of MMO. Later on, uh, the, the mistakes that I made more had to do with content aggregation uh, because what happened by, uh, by the mid-2000s uh, is that an, a second generation of, uh, of aggregators uh, came online, uh, specifically like Reddit and Dig. Uh, and uh, those guys uh, had some really critical advantages that I wasn't able to capitalize on, particularly around content volume. Uh, Slashdot was always manually curated by a small editorial panel. And when the generation of the second generation of aggregators came along, they opened that up uh, to the community at large to overall weight the value of that content. And I knew at that moment that everything was screwed because I had been watching what regular users thought was good. And I knew that there was no possible way for me to maintain the tone of Slashdot with with by with after I had given away that level of control uh, to the popula the regular population. Now the flip side is that uh, the digs and the reddits uh, they were able to scale uh, to dramatic sizes. Although I think you could make a pretty good case that uh, the quality uh, is suspect on on all of the existing platforms. And really, the only ways that these things work uh, at scale is by segmenting things into subreddits uh, and then of course dig. Uh, they ultimately did not do too well after taking more venture capital funding and spending it in like a year and a half than we spent in like a decade. <laughs> uh, watching Diggs rise and fall. Uh, I assume you watch that fairly closely. Yeah, I mean, you could probably make the argument that I gave him the idea. 
I mean, I literally sat down with him, had breakfast. He asked me, would this thing work? I told him why Slashdot oh. couldn't do it. Uh, and he was like, cool. And then he went and did it. <laughs> One of the things that was so interesting for me watching Dig is um, a principle I've learned through a lot of trial and error that I bet you've learned too, which is what works at one scale doesn't always work at another scale. So Dig had these leaderboards and uh, they were the top contributors, mm -hmm. the people most upvoted, right. right. And that's, they, that's gonna work fine. No problem will come with that. <laughs> right. So, and it worked for a while. People were competing and they were into it. And, you know, they had a few mechanisms to try and get them not to game it too much. You know, they did the, they, they, they did groups, you know, now people are doing it on Instagram. I'll follow you. You follow me. You know, they did a lot of that. So there, yeah. there was that kind, which is very co-op, which is kind of interesting. And at a sure. certain scale, that's okay. But then what happened was other competitors came on the scene that would pay contributors, specifically Yahoo. Wow. And they went and looked at Dig's leaderboards and went, thank you, Dig, oh. offered deals to all the people and whoop, off they went. We had we had a like, few of that. Oops. We had a few of those. Uh, really? Tell me. Tell me. Uh, well, there was. Uh, I mean, there, there's there's better stuff than that. I mean, the the when in the in the early two thousands, it became very clear to me that there were very few good actors uh, on the internet, uh, particularly I mean, specifically with publishers. Uh, I mean, if my if my 1% of, of all populations are jerks rule applies, that applies to publishers uh, just as much as to mortal humans. Uh, and they have often a paycheck to incentivize them. Uh, and most typical trolls, uh, don't they don't have that incentive. They still have theoretically jobs or families to deal with. Uh, what uh, we would see uh, is one publisher would submit a story to Slashdot. And in the mid 2000s, we had tools where uh, people could vote up and down content uh, that was on its way to either the homepage or the dustbin uh, and contribute on that level. And so the editorial staff was still making the final curatorial call, but the, uh, the general population could participate. Uh, and that was really awesome, except that we basically had to flag and discount the contribution of most of the publications that were involved because it was very obvious when you would see publication one, two, and three all having the same general story embargoed uh, for the same news date. Uh, and then all three of those stories come out within an hour or so of each other when the embargo lifts. And then they all come from their firewalls and their offices and go vote up and vote down their rival publications. Like even the even the legitimate uh, the the legitimate press uh, was engaged in shenaniganery, uh, which meant that we had to work through dealing with that that problem. We would see that. Uh, I mean, some of our top contributors uh, were ultimately hired uh, by different publications. Uh, some of our top contributors were simply the designated representative of major publications. And I never had a problem with any of that. If you disclosed that you were from, you know, PC world or whatever, I don't care. Tell me where you're from. And if your story's cool, I'll post it. I, I, I tried to be with the editorial process on Slashdot. I always tried to be as, uh, as fair as possible. And if I've got three embargoed stories coming out within 24 hours or with, within 20 minutes of each other, I'll just quick read the three and pick the one that I like the best. And I mean, maybe I'm, you know, not the most flawless human being and able to make that in, in, in an unbiased way. But, you know, it's reasonably fair when it's a tie like that. Because again, this goes back to the system has more knowledge than the individuals. The system uh, me, uh, I can look at, I can look at records and databases and traffic and see what's happening. Whereas a regular user might just, might not, might not be aware that, boy, it sure is weird that every IT world story goes, gets up, goes up a bunch of points. Uh, and every PC world story goes down a couple of points or whatever, whatever the rivalry would be, uh, at the time. Uh, and users would do that and publishers would do that. But it was when the publishers started doing it that I really like, I saw an, in that moment exactly what uh, Dig and Reddit and Twitter were all in for. Uh, because it's what, like, I think that everybody knows that regular people on the internet are going to do certain unpleasant things. Uh, but I don't think that you necessarily expect it from what you would consider to be legitimate press. Uh, and basically, 
what the, the once you realize that the legitimate press is going to lie, then you also realize every organization on the planet is going to try to corrupt the system in the same way. And from there, it takes you about one step before you realize that Russia is going to be able to harvest bots and make everybody hate Star Wars or Hillary Clinton. Jonathan Ogilvie says, as a game developer who does other things, I love a good example of when not to make a game of it. So thank you for sharing that story, Rob. What I tell as a game designer who does other things myself, Jonathan, um, what I tell my clients is exactly what Rob said. And the way that I put it is just because you can measure it and use it in your back end doesn't mean you have to show it to the users. When we designed the uh, the Firehose system, which was sort of our second generation of content aggregation, I, I, I used, I, I color coded everything, which was a stupid idea for a different set of reasons, but everything existed along the spectrum, you know, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, and red and orange stories ended up on the homepage and blue and violet stuff uh, got shoved into the trash bin. Uh, my intention behind that was intentionally to get numbers off of the equation or to, to like off of the interface. You don't see numbers, you see colors. Now that ended up being a stupid idea that I didn't really think through because I didn't really consider the fact that even two of the people in my office were colorblind. Uh, so that's a whole different problem, but the the, the spirit is uh, is still uh, in the right place. I and mean, that's why it's common for every system now. Uh, if you look at the rules to first edition Dungeons and Dragons, uh, the number of points required for leveling in each individual class is actually dramatically different. It's stupid because they, they evolved that system rather than designing it from scratch. Uh, but uh, the, the, the logic behind this, if you're a player, you don't necessarily need to know those numbers. You don't necessarily need to know those goals because in, in the context of a Dungeons and Dragons game, is it good for the story, for the, the Dungeons and Dragons campaign, for the user to know that they're gonna level in five minutes? because they are going to do something different if they know they're going to level in five minutes versus if they don't think they're going to level until next time we play, which could be two weeks from now, they might, that might cause the, the, the nature of the game to change. And the same holds true in any large scale system. When I was working on MMOs in the late nineties, we studied slash dots moderation for ideas because we were dealing with exactly the same unexpected consequence. You know, we had a situation where we had built a, MMO and had a beta of role players, thee and thou and milady and let's role play and, you know, theater geeks and they, you know, um, play Dungeons and Dragons, that whole crowd, you know what I'm talking right, watching about. Watching anyone was... played MUDs versus Moos in the early 90s, they would have, uh, I mean, oh dear God. Uh, it was a real interesting problem to watch that happen, especially uh, in Warcraft. Uh, because they had role-playing realms, and they had, uh, they, and they were one of the first ones to really run into that at massive scale. Uh, where like, you guys want to be in character, and I just want to kill the big monster. <laughs> I want a new sword. <laughs> what I learned working on that project is that so much of it is people's context, and I realized, you know, how much people are shaped by their context. Because once we opened up after beta, what happened was Doom was incredibly popular right then. Remember Doom? Hello? You know? And so all these Doom players came in and they were trained, kill anything that moves, right? That's like Doom. That's, That's the Doom, you know, stimulus response. And so them and the role players was just crazy. But then we also saw all these dynamics, which drove us to study slash dot. Um, we saw all these dynamics. We'd set up systems to what we thought would be to mark and disincentivize griefing, ho, ho, ho. The griefers said, it's a leaderboard. I'm gonna be the best griefer. Right. Like, right. it was it's just like, game. it was again, you know, what Jonathan Ogilvy is saying. It's like, you really need to be careful about what numbers you measure and use and how you show any version of those numbers, whether it's just the number or a delta of the number or a color, right? This is what we're talking about when we talk about abstracting. Sometimes you don't show them anything. You just use yeah. it, right? But sometimes yeah. you do show them stuff. And then part of the art of good game design is, or good product design is what you show them and when. How do you think about that in your own work today, having learned what you learned? 
Well, I, there, there were a couple of things I just wanted to throw out there. One is the the context right. part. The context part that you mentioned is really cool. Uh, really, a really big deal. Uh, Slashdot had subsections, which was our experiments for trying to do what eventually, like people in today's world would think of as a subreddit. Uh, and we were doing something like that around maybe 2000 or 99. And it was really interesting to see the behavioral differences between these subsections of the site versus the main section of the site. They were, the, 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 sec the, the topics themselves, uh, one was a politics section, which unsurprisingly uh, would be uh, a little more hostile or aggressive uh, than the other ones. Uh, but uh, like the gen like the book reviews, uh, were generally like really like a, so a relatively supportive community. The abuses that you would see there was smaller. Now the question is, was it the subject matter? Uh, book reviews being, uh, you can draw a stereotype about people who buy books, read books, and want to discuss books on a website. Uh, and you can draw a, a, a line about what that group of people might look like relative to people who really want to get up in arms about whatever government agency is doing whatever bad thing that is probably going to encroach upon your rights. Those com those those populations looked different, and that bared out in the numbers. Uh, we would see just different things statistically. The other thing that you're saying is that uh, I limited the the scoring on Slashdot. Uh, Comments at some point became limited to a score from negative, well, effectively negative one to five uh, integers. Uh, now, this is a legacy thing because in 1997, I didn't have the ability to store floating points efficiently in my database and have fractional values. Uh, and so it was easier to just say, you got moderated up. All right, your score goes up by one, a one to one ratio between moderation and score. Uh, over time, uh, the system under the hood became much more abstracted uh, and the actual computations to compute that score from negative one to five uh, became more complicated. Uh, here's a, a, a weird example of this. Uh, if, your com if your comment is at five and you get moderated up, but the limit is five, well, what happens? Well, your comment stays five because it can't be, it, none can be added to it, right? The five is your max. But then somebody else comes along and moderates you down, so you go to negative four. So a score five comment that is moderated up then down becomes moder becomes a value of four, which is therefore lower than it would have been had those uh, those other moderations not actually been done to it. You have to abstract this stuff away from user visibility. I would get unending streams of emails from people who would be so furious with me because their comment that was a score four and clearly worthy of being a score five was not a score five for whatever slights uh, against them. Usually it was that somebody was like racist and they hated them personally or like some sort of vendetta uh, against them. People would invent elaborate conspiracy theories because in, for a time in Slashdot's history, that one-to-one -one ratio of a score up of one point to, uh, to uh, you know, one-to-one -one for moderation points to comment score was relatively stable with a few exceptions that were in place for sort of security reasons. Uh, I mean, abstraction matters. Uh, n you really got to... Think through when you make when you make a decision about showing information to a user. You really need to think through how they can use that in the worst way possible. There came a point for us where it just we would not give users new information. We would only give them old information or figure out ways to simplify uh, what they were seeing because there was very little new information that I could give you. The the comment, read the comments, look at the score, the number that I've already given you. That that you know I've under the hood put dramatic effort into abstracting so the user sees score negative one to five, but underneath there could be a thousand numbers that are turning it into that score negative one to five, but that's not immediately apparent uh, to, to regular users. All of this stuff becomes tremendously time consuming, tremendously expensive uh, in terms of your engineering and designer time. Uh, and man, if you just think it through before you get started, uh, you'll, you'll have a lot easier time with it. So, that's awesome perspective on system design. And that echoes a lot of what I've learned. And I think you just articulated, in a sense, the difference between gamification and game design. Um, and, a, and a lot of what I've personally learned as a game designer is you don't just show them the raw information. Like, you just, de like, that's but yeah, not. Twitter and Facebook both did. Right. But I really think the takeaway is that these systems have unexpected consequences, they're tricky, and being able to uh, imagine what might happen and thoughtfully build your social systems in the next few decades is a key strategic advantage.
especially if you're building anything with a business model that's based on long-term engagement. So thank you so much for sharing your wisdom, Rob. Happy to help. Hey, innovator. Wondering what innovation advice you should follow? Hop on over to gamethinking.io slash programs to learn how you can work with us. We can help you get to product market fit in record time and build products that keep your customers coming back again and again. The link is in the description.